Our subject tonight concerns Genesis 1, 2, and 3, the foundation of God's purpose with mankind. And we're going to take a few principles from these three chapters, which demonstrate, in fact, that these first three chapters are the seedbed, if you like, or the foundation of some important doctrinal principles throughout the Word of God. Unfortunately, society itself has really dismissed the Bible as a fable, and particularly dismiss the accounts of the first three chapters of this remarkable book of Genesis. But we hope to show this evening that indeed it's a book, it's a section of the Bible, which was endorsed by people like Jesus Christ, by the Apostle Paul, and therefore stands with authority as the veritable word of God. You know, those opening words in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1 have an eloquence about them, don't they? In the beginning... God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. You know, when you look at some of the mythological accounts of the creation of the world through society, you find them all embedded with fabulous, mysterious, strange stories of beasts and animals vomiting and creating the world as it is. But there's, there's an elegance and simplicity with Genesis chapter 1, isn't there? God said, let there be light, and there was light. God said, and it was done. The creation is simply explained in the first chapter of Genesis. In fact, Genesis chapter 1 has a very simple symmetry about the account. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Come across to chapter 2 and verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. So you see in Genesis 1 verse 1 and Genesis 2 verse 1, you have, if you like, two bookends. The creation of the heavens and earth in chapter 1 verse 1, and the finishing of the heavens and earth in chapter 2 verse 1. And between those two bookends comes the very simple but powerful account of the creation record. You see, in the beginning is not the beginning of all time. It's in fact the beginning of God's work with our generations, if you like, with, with our planet, uh, with, with our framework that we know today. And we'll prove that in a moment. So, so in, in verse 1 we have, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Chapter 2, verse 1, he finished that. And you see... The rest of chapter 1 defines the heavens and the earth. So we see, for example, in verse 9, God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear. In verse 10, he called the dry land earth. Very simple. The earth is defined by the chapter itself. The same with the heavens. You see, God made a firmament in verse 6, and he called it heaven. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It's defined by the context. We're not talking about the uh, creation of the cosmos or, or deep space or all the galaxies that we know together. We are talking simply about the creation of the heavens and earth that we know, defined by chapter 1. Now, is this record correct? Let's come across to Mark chapter 10 because it was endorsed by Jesus Christ himself. If you believe in Jesus Christ, then you believe in Genesis chapter 1. Now Mark chapter 10, the Lord is arguing a doctrinal point about the significance of marriage. In verse 6 of Mark 10, Jesus said this, but from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. Then he quotes Genesis, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. Now I want you to notice verse 6 very carefully. From the beginning. So he obviously took a word from Genesis 1 verse 1. Of the creation of God, Genesis 1 verse 1, in the beginning God created but he's defining the beginning of the creation as the time when God made man and woman, which was on the sixth day. So you see, in the beginning, 
It's not the beginning of all time. It's the beginning of our creation. Look at Romans chapter 1. This is what Paul said about creation. You see, he too endorsed the creation record. In Romans chapter 1 and verse 20, Paul said this, For the invisible things of God from the creation of the world are clearly seen. That's interesting, isn't it? Invisible things seen. Well, how can you see invisible things? Being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so they are without excuse. So from Paul's perspective, he not only endorses the creation of the world, <clears throat> but he says that there is seen a power behind this event. You see, people who have thinking minds will look at all around us and they'll see an immensity and complexity and design and intelligence that's designed in verse 20 to demonstrate God's eternal power. What keeps us alive? What, what keeps us rotating around the sun? What keeps us in all of the things that we enjoy? And Paul says that people are really without excuse because Behind all that we see is a power that's eternal. And that was Paul's view of the creation. In fact, the creation really is a recreation because, you see, Genesis starts with a planet, dark, empty, and waste. And Genesis chapter 1 <coughs> really is the filling of this empty planet with life and light. The planet was in existence, and God recreated this amazing planet to give it life and light. It was empty and dark and confused and waste. God filled it with everything. In six days. An amazing thing. His eternal power. And people who can imagine that great creative power can understand the power behind that. Now in Psalm 33, let's come to this, this is the evidence of the psalmist. So Jesus Christ endorses the creation record. The Apostle Paul endorses the creation record. And so does the author of the Psalms. Now Psalm 33 says this in verse 6. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth, he gathereth the waters of the sea together as a heap. He layeth at the depth in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spake, and it was commanded. It was done. He commanded, and it stood forth. That's pretty straight language, isn't it? By the word of the Lord were the heavens made. So, so these, these statements, God said, God said, God said, and it was so is a demonstration of the command and the power in that creative process. Imagine that. Let there be light and there was light. He commanded and it stood fast. And that's the way the record talks about the power of Genesis chapter 1. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 8. You see, in Proverbs chapter 8, we have another dimension behind the eternal power and Godhead of this creative process. In Proverbs chapter 8, we have a discussion about wisdom. And wisdom is personified as a woman who is able to give understanding and eventually life, life eternal. And in Proverbs chapter 8, the personification of wisdom is presented to us as someone alongside God when he created the world. Now look at Proverbs chapter 8, verse 22. The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his ways, before his works of old. I was set up from everlasting, from the beginning, or ever the earth was. Now, now let's just, just explain those verses. So, so God and wisdom 
existed well before the earth was made. God is wisdom. But she's presented as a person alongside God in this, in this proverb. Verse 24. When there was no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains abounding with waters. Before the mountains were settled, before the hills was I brought forth. While as yet he had not made the earth, nor the fields, nor the highest part of the dust of the world. When he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he set a compass upon the face of the depth. When he established the clouds above. When he strengthened the fountains of the deep. When he gave to the sea his decree that the water should not pass his commandment, when he appointed the foundation of the earth, then I was by him, as one brought up with him, as I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him. So, so what Proverbs chapter 8 describes is, it is not just the power behind creation, but the wisdom behind creation. Now this cuts right across current scientific thinking. Current scientific thinking not only dismisses Genesis chapter 1 as a fable, but it dismisses this whole idea of an eternal power being able to spontaneously and immediately create life in six days. It's unscientific to believe that. And the scientific community ridicules people who believe their Bibles. But where is the wisdom and power in evolution? A series of failures over millions of years? A series of destruction and devastation and competition to, to try and get some sort of advantage in society? Where is the wisdom in that? There's none whatsoever. But in the creation of God, the more scientists unveil the intricacies and the wonder of creation, the more they stand back astounded, unable to understand many things. I was reading the other day about a little silver ant in the Sahara Desert. It's an unusual ant because, one, of its color, and secondly, in the Sahara Desert, and you can imagine the temperatures in the Sahara Desert, this little creature manages to survive in the hottest environment when other insects are scurrying around trying to find some type of shade. And they decided to put this thing under the electron microscope and try and find out why it was this little ant could survive in the Sahara Desert when other insects couldn't. And they discovered on the body of this ant a special shaped hair. It's like a triangular prism. And they found, in fact, that when light goes through the hair, because it's triangular, it bounces out the other way. It's internal reflection. So, so what it does is, it allows light and heat to hit the hair and dissipate. So it keeps cool because when light strikes it and heat strikes it, it's immediately dissipated. And they find that this thing has unusually long legs, which means it's higher off the desert floor. And as it moves, it creates its own wind current that keeps it cool. And all of these things combined together make the, the intricacy of this small little insect a wonder to behold. It's a very small thing. But the more you look at the way in which it has been put together and the marvel of just these tiny hairs, deliberately prismatic, you find that there is design behind that. And that's just a simple illustration. And, and many animals have features like that, which we stand back and think, wow, that is amazing. Because in wisdom, they were created. There's wisdom behind that. Intelligence behind that. And that's the way the Word of God presents the creation itself. An amazing thing. And science can, can laugh at that, but from a biblical perspective, this chapter endorses the power and wisdom of creation. Now, there's a doctrinal significance behind this. Come to Isaiah chapter 40. See, creation is designed not just to make us stand back in awe, but to appreciate the God behind all this. Now Isaiah 40 presents it this way. Verse 25. 
To whom then will you liken me, or, or shall I be equal, saith the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high, and behold, who hath created these things. It didn't say evolve them, it said created them. That bringeth out their host by number. He calls them all by names, by the greatness of his might, for that he is strong in power, not one faileth. Now what Isaiah is saying is this. Just take the time one night to go out and to behold and lift your eyes on high and gaze at those stars and think about the power that has created them and keeps them going. And when you contemplate that, says Isaiah, I want you to understand in verse 25, there is no equal. There's none like me. There's no comparison. And my power and my strength has brought all this to bear. I want you to understand that there's a God behind all this without equal. So you see, creation has a moral force that God is inviting people to just, just go out there and contemplate the stars one night and think about the eternal power behind that. Now, how many people are prepared to do that? How many people are prepared to do that? Look at Isaiah 45. Verse 18. For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens. There it is again. This is creation we're talking about. God himself that formed the earth and made it. He hath established it. He created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. So here God stands to declare the power of his creation that he alone is the creator and he has a purpose with the earth. So we've gone to the next step. It's not just that there's a God who's created all these incredible things for us to enjoy and to survive and to have life. But there is now a purpose in all of this, and that purpose is found in verse 17. But Israel shall be saved in the Lord with an everlasting salvation. You should not be ashamed or confounded, world without end. For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens. So, so you see, Genesis chapter 1 is not just laying the foundations of the wonder of creation. It's saying behind that is wisdom, power, a God who has no equal, a God who has done this with a purpose in mind, an everlasting purpose. We as Christadelphians believe that Genesis 1, 2, and 3 are literal factual accounts of what happened. Scientists scoff at creation in six days. You know, in Exodus chapter 20, uh, Moses, the man of God, many years later, endorsed that, that simple record. You see, on the seventh day, God ceased from his labors and instituted a Sabbath day, a day of rest. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 8, Moses said this, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days thou shalt labor and do all thy work, but on the seventh is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt do any work, not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that's within thy gates. For, here's the reason, in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested on the Sabbath, Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. That's a very simple endorsement of the factual account of Genesis. And it's absolutely clear, isn't it? God worked for six days. On the seventh, he ceased. I want you to work for six days. And on the seventh, I want you to cease as well. Very simple parallel. And that is the consistent message of the rest of the Bible, endorsing the creation of Genesis chapter 1. The wonder of the creator and the power of all of that. In Genesis chapter 1, in verse 26, we're given now to understand the purpose of creation. It comes to a climax with the creation of man and woman in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. 
And God said, there it is again, you know, like Psalm 33 said, God spake and it was done. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. So the, the, the very miracle of creation. I was watching a documentary the other day called The Living Body. And you look at this documentary and you see the intricacies of, of nerves and cells and bones and the internal organs and the very brain itself, all working together intricately. In fact, the psalmist says that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And you stand back in awe at, at all this complexity all working together, all working at once, and God creating this magnificent form of life from the organism of the earth. And all of a sudden there is this complexity of an intelligent life, being able to think and to speak, having emotions. Very good was the record's pronouncement of this creation, a staggering thing when you think about that. He made man and woman, male and female. But the difference between man and the animals is explicitly, explicitly stated here that man was to have dominion. Now, on, on, a, on a literal, obvious level, man was created superior to the animals. Animals don't have the sense of moral responsibility. They simply think and act according to their instinct, that, that they can't sing praise, they can't worship, they, they can't imagine things, they can't discourse about righteousness and faith. That's all left to, to men and women. But embedded in that idea of man having dominion was a far, far greater purpose. If we come across to Psalm 8, we have David's commentary on this part of Creation. So it's not just a matter of God making man and woman. It's a matter of God making them for a reason. Now in Psalm 8, David says in verse 3, When I consider thy heaven, the works of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? So here's David going out again one evening and lifting up his eyes and just contemplating the vastness of space. And then looking at himself and saying, well, well, well who am I? Why does God even bother with mankind, seeing the vastness of that wonder out there? See, that's an intelligent response to the wonder of creation. For in verse 5, thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honour. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. So David says, in reflecting upon the creation of man, when God said to man, have dominion over all things, it was a prediction that God wants a certain individual to have all things under his control. And when we come across to 1 Corinthians 15, the Apostle Paul now explains what David was talking about and what the original intent was in the creation of man and woman. Now, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 27, Paul quotes, For he hath put all things under his feet. So he's now going to explain what it means when God created man and woman and put all things under his feet. So let's read, shall we, from verse 21. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. 
That's an interesting section of scripture, isn't it? We're going to look at Genesis 3 in a moment and talk about the entrance of sin and death into the world. But Paul is saying that if you're in Christ, you'll be made alive. And we'll talk about that at the conclusion of our address. What does it mean to be in Christ? But he says there's an order. And the order is, is that first Jesus Christ was given life, and then in verse 23, afterwards, they that are Christ's at his coming. So that is saying that Jesus Christ is going to come back to the earth. And when he comes back to the earth, he's going to reward people according to their deeds. Then in verse 24, cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up to the up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall put down all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. And the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death, for he hath put all things under his feet. Now Paul's argument is like this. Man was created to have rulership over everything. But there was embedded in that idea that one day there would be a particular individual who would in fact have dominion over everything. And by everything, he means everything except God. All rule, all authority, all power, and even death itself. So right back in the beginning of the creation of God, God had in mind an individual who would in fact have rulership and dominion. That man is Jesus Christ. So you see, that's why Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3 is so powerful. It's not just the description of the amazing creation of God. It's a description of a purpose that he has with the earth. So God is planning all this in those first six days of creation. He's planning an individual to have dominion over all things. He's planning a king. The creation of man and woman has a purpose. Now, back in Genesis chapter 1, when God created man and woman, it was pronounced at the end of the chapter, verse 31, that God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. When God makes something, and God creates something, it's very good. We see the evidence of that around us, even in a very marred creation. Things work. With just the right distance from the sun to have the right atmosphere. The earth has the right tilt that we can enjoy the seasons. The composition of the atmosphere is just right that we can breathe the right mixture of oxygen and nitrogen. The fact that we have feet on the ground while the earth is spinning is, is, is evidence of the, the goodness that God has shown. It's all very good. In Genesis chapter 2, we give a more detail about the events of chapter 1. Some people say there are contradictions in the Bible. Genesis 1 is one creation, Genesis chapter 2 is another creation. That's not the case. Genesis chapter 2 is an expansion of the sixth day. It gives us more detail about what God was doing and why he was doing things on that sixth day. And part of that gives a little bit more description about the creation of man and woman. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7, The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And that verse is important because it gives us the detail about the creation of man. The record says that he was formed of the dust of the ground. So the composition of the elements of the ground were all used to form this incredible shape of a man. And all the nerve endings and all the intelligence and the bone structure, all there from the dust of the ground. And then oxygen rushing through that individual. It's called, as it were, breathe into man. Atmosphere. And, and, and the lungs took that first breath of life. And God sparking that life. 
created the man. What an amazing thing to imagine that. And the record says at the end of verse 7, man became a living soul. Now, unfortunately, one of the great deceits of religion today has really misinterpreted this verse. It doesn't matter where you go in religious circles today, you'll find the doctrine of the immortality of the soul. It's a teaching that says that when men and women die, there's an inner spark and that goes off either to heaven or to hell. It's in virtually every single religion in the face of the earth. And tragically, it's the greatest lie, the greatest unbiblical truth that's been perpetrated upon mankind for thousands of years. It does not say in verse 7 that man had an immortal soul. It said when man was created, he was a living soul. Now that expression there, living soul, actually occurs back in chapter 1. It's in chapter 1 and verse 20, God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life. Now that expression there, creature that hath life, is living soul. And if we were to read the original Hebrew scriptures, living soul simply means a natural body. That's all it was. Man became a natural body. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul uses this quote to prove there is a natural body. So rather than reading, as the churches do, that man possesses an immortal soul, all the Genesis record is saying is, is that man became a living natural body. There is no such teaching in the scriptures concerning <coughs> an immortal soul. So you see, it's more than just a creation record. It's establishing doctrines that are significant. And we could have a whole lecture on the mortality of man, but I just want to turn one quotation up, Psalm 146. Because in Psalm 146, we have in absolutely clear language what happens to people at death. And this is the reality of life, Psalm 146. Out there in, in those millions and millions of people who believe this lie, this, the tragedy of all of that is that they put their confidence in something which is not going to happen. Now here's the reality of death, Psalm 146, verse 3. Put not your trust in princes, nor in the Son of Man in whom there is no help. Why? His breath goes forth, he returns to his earth. In that very day, his thoughts perish. And that quotation is consistently matched with other quotations of the Bible that talk about the finality of death. It's very real. In that very day, his thoughts perish. Man was not created with an immortal spark within him. Death is death, is perishing. And that's the reality of the biblical record. Let's come back to Genesis chapter 2. Now God placed within the midst of the garden two trees. One was called the tree of life, the other the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The tree of life, in fact, was a tree that was offering eternal life. Now we know that because when man sinned, he was expelled from the garden lest he should eat of the tree and live forever. So that's interesting. That all the creation that God does, this purpose and wisdom is now being manifested. So he places in the middle of the garden a, a hope, if you like, an opportunity, if you like, for everlasting life. So though he created life in six days, he, he's offering everlasting life. You see, that's, that's our God. That's our Father in heaven. He's giving men and women the opportunity to seize eternal life. But beside that was another tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And he placed the law upon one of those trees. In verse 16 of chapter 2, The Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt die, surely die. Now, just think about what God is doing here. He, he has created this, this, this paradise on earth. And the first couple there, Adam and Eve, are enjoying the wonder of that. 
They were given the responsibility of tending the garden. There was labor and opportunity and rejoicing. Wonderful paradise. But God gave to man and woman a law. Why does he do that? Why should he do that? Well, he's establishing a principle that, that he seeks from men and women obedience to his commands. Because if a person voluntarily and lovingly obeys God's commands... God will reward that. So here's a test. Do they really love him? Do they really believe in him? Do they, do they really want to please him? And it's a very generous law, isn't it? Every tree you can freely eat, all the different varieties of trees in the world, you can take your pick of any one of them except one. There's nothing onerous about that. And there's nothing within... Man and woman's desire to go beyond that. They're very happy to be within the parameters of that, to eat of every tree except that one. Woman was created from the side of Adam. There's a sympathy and bond between man and woman. And even again, in that simple record of creation, we have a purpose. In verse 24 of chapter 2, Therefore shall a man... Leave his father and his mother, shall cleave to his wife, and they shall be one flesh. It didn't say man marry man, or woman marry woman. It's man and woman together. You see, the purpose of God in the creation of man and woman was, was to have a unity of thought and purpose, and eventually the generation of a godly seed. That, that was God's ideal. To be one flesh, united in their beliefs and aspirations and hopes and desires and their love. And that very bond would produce an environment for children to develop the things of God. See, when, when God creates with purpose and wisdom, there's great blessing and benefit for those who can understand that relationship, can understand what God wants. And you step outside that with same-sex marriage. You step outside that with all of the immorality and the unfaithfulness and the marriage bond and you break society down and you have all sorts of ills and evils. Never so in the beginning. The creation of man and woman was the pinnacle of what God's purpose was. Now the law had been given. And it was not now time, I guess, to see whether man and woman really were prepared to obey God. In chapter 3 and verse 1, we're introduced to the serpent. The authorised version has very subtle. The NIV had crafty. Uh, in actual fact, the Hebrew word, if we were to look at the original, simply means quick of perception. Now, science just pushes this chapter away and says, well, how can you ever have a snake that talks? Well, you see, that they don't believe in creation full stop. They don't believe in the word of God. So there's no concept at all that any of this makes any sense to them. But Paul endorsed this. Jesus Christ endorsed this record. Jesus Christ said of God's word, thy word is truth. We either believe that or we don't. Now, this serpent was quicker perception. But being an animal, it had no capacity to be able to think about moral things. It's got no idea of why should we should do things or, or the morality of keeping God's command. None of that would enter into its perceptions at all. It simply observed and spoke. And at some point, it had observed the fact that the prohibition on eating that tree didn't make any sense. This is a very simple logic. If you eat the tree, your eyes will be opened. If your eyes are opened, you can't be dead. Hence, you won't die. Simple logic. Simple logic. And that simple logic, in fact, had the effect of deceiving the woman. Adam wasn't deceived, but the woman was. 
Yea, hath God said, you shall not leave every tree in the garden. There's a conversation ensuing here. And this serpent is simply reflecting the observation that's made. It may have picked this up through conversa hearing conversation or some other means. We don't know. We're not told. But by observation, it came as conclusion. If your eyes are open, you're not going to die. Well, in verse 6, the woman begins to take on board the serpent's suggestion and in so doing, pushes God and his command out of her mind. There is her first mistake. So in verse 6, she saw that the tree was good for food, pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise. All of that in her mind, circulating in her thoughts, Pushing God's commands out, she began to think like the serpent. Tragic. And in the end, all of those unlawful desires produced a disobedience and she took the fruit. And Adam too transgressed with her. And that tragedy, that disobedience, brought upon it not only for themselves, but also for their children and for many generations afterwards, the tragedy of sin and death in the world. It's not of God's doing. Man introduced all of that. Genesis chapter 3 describes the awfulness of that. Verse 17, God said to Adam, Because thou hast hearkened to the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree which, which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return to the ground. For out of it thou wast taken. For dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. And the tragedy and the sorrow, the corruption, the vanity of life is all because of that single transgression. It's awful when you think about it, isn't it? The paradise of God, the opportunity to serve him, lost through this transgression. Now, if we come across to Romans chapter 5, Paul summarizes this <clears throat> awful event this way. Romans chapter 5. Verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man <clears throat> sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Now, there's, there's a lot compressed in that verse. <coughs> Excuse me. Firstly, it is man's fault that sin is in the world. And as a consequence of that, sin comes death. But that death sentence is passed on all men because all have sinned. Now what Paul is saying is this, is that there was, as a result of Adam and Eve's transgression, not just death as a sentence being passed, but now there is within their nature an inevitability of sinning. There's a proneness to sin. And that's what Paul is saying. How is it that God could pass the death sentence upon every single individual thousands of years later who had nothing to do with Adam's transgression? How, how could that possibly be fair? Because at the end of verse 12, all have sinned. There is an inevitability about sin that God can pass the death sentence upon every single individual even though we've got nothing to do with Adam's transgression. And that's the tragedy that we find ourselves in, not just subject to death or mortality, but within our very frame is this inevitability of doing the wrong thing. See, Paul expressed it this way. Come across to Romans chapter 7. In verse 18, he says, For I know that in me, that's in my flesh, dwells no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. And that's the frustration that he found. He wanted to do the right thing, ended up 
doing the wrong thing. And he didn't want to do the wrong thing, and he ended up doing it. And that tragic situation is where mankind finds itself as a result of that sin through Adam. It will be inevitable that at some point in our lives we will do the wrong thing, think the wrong thing, and transgress. And because of that, God passes a death sentence upon all mankind. Now, God pushed Adam and Eve out of the garden. They were not permitted to eat of the tree of life. God is not going to reward disobedience with eternal life. And in the mercy and goodness of God, God has in fact provided a way back to that garden, if you like, a way back to the tree of everlasting life. He has given us an opportunity of reversing all of that. How is that possible? How is that possible? We're going to die. We're inevitably going to do the wrong thing. What's the way back? Well, there is a way back. In John chapter 14... The Bible says this. Verse 6, a very simple expression, John 14. Jesus saith to him, as to Thomas, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now, what's Jesus Christ saying? He's saying, well, there is a way back to God, but it is only through me. It's not through Buddha, not through Confucius, not through Joseph Smith, not through the Pope. It's through Jesus Christ. And he has established a way back, and that way involves the truth. And that's why Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3 is so important because it lays the foundations of truth that we have to really appreciate. The power and creation of God, the single unity of God, the uniqueness of God, the purpose of God, the graciousness of God in offering eternal life, the truth. If we haven't got the truth, we haven't got the way back. So the Lord said, I am the vehicle, I am the way back to the Father. And that involves truth and it involves life. So where there was death and where the way of the tree of life was prevented and prohibited, Jesus now opens that way up. The truth and the life. So in Mark chapter 16, which is our final quote for this evening, this really, in a couple of verses, just summarizes the way back. How will God give us everlasting life? How how will he reverse all those processes that man introduced through his disbelief and disobedience? But in Mark chapter 16 and verse 15, this is what Jesus said. He said to them, disciples, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned or condemned. So there it is in a nutshell. If you can understand the gospel, believe the gospel, and be baptized in that understanding of belief, you'll be saved. There's nothing ambiguous about that, nothing difficult to understand about that, but it's the way back. We need to understand what the gospel is, and we have addresses from this place that define the gospel. We need to understand what baptism is all about. We have lectures which describe the purpose of baptism. But if we can believe and understand those things and have the truth, that also will have the life. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved.